Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming out to another in our continuing series of panel discussions relative to important topics pertaining to gender, ethnic, cultural issues that we're all dealing with on a regular basis. Today we have a today we have an august body of students. I believe everybody's a student here, led by our esteemed director of the She's, she's big, big timer here. Um, and we're going to have an engaging conversation. I hope you all will enjoy it. Um, please make sure you finish up the food and um, have a great Women's History Month continued. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Generals. Thanks all for coming. I apologize, I have some leftover congestion from this, <laughs> from break. Um, but welcome to the Women's History Month Fireside Chat. We're really pleased that you all could come. I know it's rough Monday right after break, so thank you so much for coming. Um, today we have an esteemed panelist of staff and students who've been involved with anti-violence work here at the college through a state grant called It's On Us that focuses on um, education around domestic violence, sexual assault, and ways to create a safer campus and lived environment here at the college. Um, so for, you know, for anyone, just a trigger warning, we may have some talk, obviously, about anti-violence work. Feel free to step out or take time if you need it, if, or if it's not um, something you're comfortable hearing about. But I also wanted to recognize one very special student we have with us, Angie, who is also um, involved with this and a Parks Leadership um, Scholarship through the college. It's a program we run every year now that is celebrating students who have taken specific initiative and gone kind of above and beyond to really um, think of projects and launch them across the college. So Angie, if you want to introduce what you're working on and then we'll go into the panel. Hi, my name is Angie. Um, currently, I've been working on this project. Um, it's called the Period Poverty Project. And what we do is basically a student-led initiative that focuses on ensuring free period products for CCP students, Northeast Campus, Main Campus, the West Campus. And we're focusing on expanding more. We've gotten this amazing grant from Parks. And we've also um, been receiving donations the past few weeks, which have been super helpful. And yeah, I just, I hope you guys can support this initiative and spread the word. Thank you. Thanks. So there's a QR code to donate. Um, and we also, if anyone is in need, we have some to give away in the back um, from the first round of donations that Angie's gotten for us. Um, and now I'd like to, everyone, if you could, we'll pass the mic down. Maybe you can introduce yourself, sort of like what your role is at the college, what year you are, if you're staff, what you do. Um, Angie just went, but we'll <laughs> give it to you again. Um, my name is Angie Orozco, and I am a first year student. It's my second semester, and I'm a business major. Hello, my name is Nazir Thomason. I am a second year student and I work with Melissa in the Women's Center. And that's it. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shakita Jacobs and I am the Resources Support Specialist for the Cato Scholarship. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Arkees Ponton. I'm a certified peer specialist with NAMI. I'm also soon to work with as a peer support at um, Bridgeway High School, and that's a little bit about me. And also to shout out Keys, Shakita, and Nazir, they completed a 40-hour state certification to be an advocate in domestic violence crisis response. Um, and Angie is on her road to doing some major training in that as well. So um, for our first question to open it, I wanted to ask you all, um, can you share with us a little bit about your personal journey or motivation for getting involved with anti-violence work in the college? And, Answer all, answer one, you know, you don't all have to answer each one if you don't feel like it. Um, I'll go first. So growing up, I grew up in a household with a mother who experienced domestic violence. Um, she's a domestic violence survivor. Um, so I witnessed this a lot throughout childhood. Um, being an older sibling, I had to take responsibility for my younger siblings and take care of them while my mom struggled with domestic violence. Um, Eventually, things changed in a better way. Um, so that's what kind of geared me towards this work and why I'm so passionate about it is because I've personally experienced it in my household. 
Um, my personal or my motivation for it is I I don't have any personal experience in domestic violence, but I know that there's people out there that do, and I am a very empathetic person, and I want to make a difference for them, and I want to help them in a good way. So I do have loved ones and friends who have unfortunately um, experienced domestic violence and sexual assault. So um, this past year, I've been committed to being an advocate for them. Um, something that has motivated me um, to want to get into this work within the mental health field is certain things in my family that have taken place, such as domestic violence, sexual abuse, uh, substance abuse as well. Um, it's just certain things that I took witness to in my childhood and certain things I've seen in the city, and I want to be able to make an impact, especially on the youth who experience that as well, which is something that I would really like to get involved in is recovery coaching. I want to be able to be those mentors that I probably needed when I was experiencing certain things when I was younger. Thank you all so much for sharing. Our next question here is, in your learning about gender-based violence, is there something that has surprised you or been very helpful in your work supporting friends or students? So I have been pleasantly surprised by the wealth of resources available throughout the city. Um, there's various anti-domestic violence and sexual assault programs in the city. Um, it's reassuring to know that there are very specific resources tailored for um, undocumented individuals to Hispanic individuals, which addresses a diverse range of needs. Um, and yeah, I'm just grateful to know and learn about these and be able to speak to my peers about them. So what I don't it's not a lot of things that surprise me because I've been working in this field for a long time and have seen a lot of things. But what has helped me um, in supporting people who experience domestic violence is changing the language. So instead of looking at individuals as victims, changing that language to survivors. Um, and being a survivor can mean many things. Sometimes that means staying in a situation that you're in to survive. Um, and sometimes that means like walking away. So just changing the language and how we identify individuals who are surviving domestic violence. Um. What I, when I did my training, I, there was like stories that we heard and there were like horrible stories and it was like hard to hear. And I kind of, I think, I don't say teared up, but it was, it was tear jerking. And I don't, I don't want to like have to see anyone that I know go through that ever and they shouldn't. Um, something that I'm working on that I will be facilitating leading is with my team NAMI is that we're going to be starting engagement support groups where we allow young men or young girls to come in and they be able to share their stories and we can hear certain things that they experience, certain recoveries that they use to help them get through with their experience, um, obstacles that they might have had a hard time managing through and figuring out what resources and services that we could provide for them and such as going to other events and getting them connected with people in order for them to continue through the recovery journey. Great. So our next question is about like challenges and resistance. Um, have you encountered any challenges or resistance to your work preventing violence, either within the college or in your personal community, with your friends, your family, and how have you dealt with it? So I have not personally encountered challenges or resistance in my efforts to prevent gender-based violence. But if I did, it, I would respond to it in an educational and empathetic way. Um, the challenges I've faced in this is probably thinking that I can't do it. That's like the only thing I can think of. Is thinking that I wasn't like, not emotional enough, but like empathetic enough to help or to care. But I do, and I see that now, so I'm trying. 
I think one of the main challenges that I've experienced overall is that it's taboo to talk about violence, um, especially domestic violence. So um, just having a safe space where individuals could come in and not be afraid to share um, and not feel judged. So that's one of the biggest challenges I've seen. Okay. Our next question is what support or resources do you believe are essential for sustaining long-term efforts in preventing violence on college campuses? Um, I think that the college having accessible training programs and prevention programs, such as um, the one that Nazir recently did, um, the 40-hour domestic violence training that was provided by the Lutheran Settlement House. It was a great program from what I've heard. Um, I think also collaboration with community organizations to enhance prevention efforts and also data collection and assessment to understand student behaviors and effectiveness of these prevention programs to evaluate and continue improving these campus initiatives. I think places like the Women's Center is like a perfect example of things we should have on every campus. Place where you can go talk about what happened or what you need or make a plan about what you have to do and how to get out that situation that you're in. And so I think we should have more of those everywhere, not even just for campuses, like outside the city, just a place where women can be around other women to talk about their problems. Just, it's like a perfect place because everyone has to have a place to talk. That's like the main goal for anything, is to talk about everything that happened. Um, I would agree having more services accessible on campus, um, as well as having more individuals trained in um, the domestic violence training. Um, and other forms of violence training and tr being more trauma informed. So just having services readily available, having it posted, um, making people feel comfortable to be able to share um, and just having people trained in each department who can identify individuals experiencing domestic violence. And um, to just add on something that I would like to bring to the forefront that some people may not be aware of is RAP training, Wellness Recovery Action Plan, where um, you take the time to kind of create some sort of resource for yourself when you're experiencing a crisis. So somebody you may be able to trust, uh, resources or a nearest crisis response center when you're experiencing some type of crisis or seeing what things work for you to kind of cope or trying to figure out setting goals for yourself, you know, for something that you may be looking forward to, maybe a new home, maybe trying to get away from your situation, what people do you trust or what can I do for you when you're not well. So sitting down with a person, teaching them how to sort of create a plan for themselves to be able to sustain their wellness. Great. So our next uh, prompt is about the involvement of men. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to say that we have four men participating in this peer leadership program, um, which and their participation and support in this work is invaluable. But um, in what ways, and I'd like everyone to respond to this too, not just Nazir and Keys. In what ways do you believe men can actively contribute to the prevention of sexual assault and domestic violence? Um, I believe that men can acquire as much information from the women around them, ask them, oh, like, what can I do to make you and other women in our community um, feel safe? I think that's a great stepping stone. I feel like, in my experience, I you need to, like, there has to be, like, another man to tell you that you're doing something wrong. Because if... If I see it and I have to tell you that you're doing something wrong, that means it's not, you have to stop. You have to stop. So we need more men out there to tell people that they're doing stuff wrong instead of just like letting them do it or letting them continue that behavior that has been abusive or any, like any other way. Um, I agree. Um, just holding each other accountable. Um, also in other terms, like 
helping to make other, helping to make men feel safe who experience domestic violence um, because men do experience domestic and sexual violence. So just providing that safe space for a man or a, a young boy to come in and to be able to talk to someone without being stigmatized. I agree. Um, to just add on to what you say, uh, that men can also believe that recovery is possible. Most times we feel like we don't feel safe or don't feel like we can be taken serious when we do speak up about abuse that we may experience in the door. And sometimes the way that's exhibited as the, as we get older is that we become abusive to ourselves or other people. So believe it, that I can go seek professional help or I can speak up and share my story because you may never know who, you know, another young male that's experiencing that as well. So just believing that you can go and seek that professional help and not believing that it's not realistic that it won't work all right how do you prioritize self-care and prevent burnout while engaging in emotionally demanding activism or work with people experiencing trauma I would say I'm um, taking a break um, and I'm even teaching myself that um, sometimes I could get emotional emotionally attached to people's stories and what I hear so believing that um, it's okay to take a break it's okay to figure out what works for me, um, trying to remember that, not to solve everybody's problem, being a superhero, believing that I could fix what they're going through, that I have to step in these shoes and take over their problems, believing that I could step away and allow that person to be in control of what they're going through and I could just assist and would be a strong support system from the side while emotionally being fully invested in it because sometimes it does take a toll on your mental health and it just doesn't do any type of justice to your peace. So just taking a break and just emotionally separating from the person's trauma. I would say for me personally, um, having someone to talk to, um, for example, I go to therapy um, twice a month. And so that's my outlet when I'm dealing with not just like work-related issues or home-related issues with any type of issues. So I'm a big advocate of having someone to talk to, um, whether it's a therapist, a close friend, um, a colleague, um, a supervisor, just having someone else to talk to with knowing that you're not alone and just reminding myself that self-care is important. Um, I agree. Um, I regularly assess my emotional well-being and I do also really like talking to my therapist um, who I see every week. I think that's another way for me to decompress and I also incorporate different breathing techniques in my day-to-day -day life. Um, I also um, seek support from individuals at the Women's Center. Um, someone who I seek support from is one of our interns. She's not here, but she's a great support. Um, I am like the king of burnout. Like I, I work I work myself to the core every time, and then I have to dig myself out that grave that I dig, that I do. So what I try to do is I try to talk to my therapist every week just to get like get my my week out there because I do so much, and I also should like stop. You have to like sometimes you just have to stop. That's like the main thing. Like I know it's hard, but sometimes you have to just like put a hold there and take a break. And you shouldn't like force yourself to wake up in the morning. It should be like that. You should just get up and leave out the house. You shouldn't have to work, wake up, think about all the things you have to do and all the things people have to save. People, have, people you have to save. They're they're not. You can't save everyone. That's what I had to learn. I just want to give a personal shout out to everyone for being so open and talking about going to therapy because it's such like I mean, good for you guys. Like <laughs> I go, we all go. Um, it's taking care of your mental health first is the most important thing. Like, you can't help others if you're not helping yourself. There's always that, that line in any helping career. So thank you for sharing that, because I think students, staff, administrators, like, we all deal with some pretty intense stuff. And without an outlet and a sounding board and a place to process it, I don't think anyone here could, could do that work. So thank you for sharing that. Um, now, to go on from that, what advice would you give other students who are interested in getting involved in anti-violence work but might not know where to start? Um, I would suggest visiting the Women's Center because they have um, so many resources. Everyone's really friendly, and they can guide you to 
like the correct programs, et cetera. Um, every time I go to the Women's Center, I always feel very welcome and comfortable. I agree. I'm always there if anyone needs to learn about resources or anything else, just to talk. I'm there. You can come upstairs. What number is this? S309. <laughs> I would say just reach out and ask someone how you can help. Um, every little bit matters and counts, so just ask someone, and um, someone will be able to usually point you in the right direction or find someone else to um, help you if you want to help. I would say anybody that definitely wants to get into, you know, the mental health field with wanting to work with people to make sure emotionally, you know, that you're healed from your hurt, your past, any trauma that you experience, because this work can be very triggering. Just, you know, having to hear certain people's stories and certain things that they live and experience, it can definitely touch home and can bring up some certain things that you didn't expect. So just make, making sure that you're emotionally set for the job. And here's our last question for you all. Looking ahead, what are your hopes and aspirations for the impact of our anti-violence work here at the college? How can we create a culture of care and support here? Looking ahead, I envision our anti-violence efforts at the college making a meaningful impact by fostering a culture of care and support. My hope is for more people to become involved with the It's On Us program here at CCP and actively participate in its initiatives. Um, to create this culture, um, we should continue engaging in more open discussions like these about anti-violence work, um, continue telling people about all the resources at the Women's Center and offering more training programs to all CCP students. Um, such as the ones that many of us have attended. Um, by doing so, we can make everyone feel welcome and comfortable to contribute to preventing sexual assault and domestic violence. Um, looking ahead, I plan on making a difference. Not like, I want to make a big difference. And I, not to be vague, but I, can't, I can show you better than I can tell you. Looking ahead, um, I would hope to see more services offered at CCP, um, more individuals trained to support individuals experiencing violence and sexual abuse. Um, of course, more funding to go behind that uh, because we need it for sure. Um, and just seeing more people get actively engaged. Um, looking ahead, I want to be able to help the decreasement of the opioid use and the gun violence within the city. And I believe by doing that, um, as I continue to advance in this field, advocating for quality and change, not being afraid to speak up for certain things that we should be doing and to you know, help people that's out here struggling. Great. Yeah, I think that goes back to the point of like hurt people hurt people and all, all violence tends to be connected. You know, it doesn't come out of nowhere. Uh, and that's the end of our formal portion. I do want to say, too, um, if this sparks anything for faculty, staff, students, students you work with and want to get involved, we do still have some scholarship spaces open. Um, we've made it pretty easy. <laughs> Just we want people to get in the door. There's, um, it's between 200 and, $250 and $500 uh, available for this semester to do between um, probably about four 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 hours and up of work with us, training, volunteering, um, some more intensive learning on that. So if you have any students who would like to be involved with the scholarship program, please send them our way. We also will be continuing it next year. We are refunded by the state um, to have more of this going on and to build off of the success. Um, so far as a pilot, it's been going great. Um, for administrators, staff, or students who really, really want to get into it, there are more 40-hour state certification programs coming through that we have a partnership with Lutheran Settlement House to offer free. They normally would be between five and six hundred dollars, so it's an excellent credential and certification to put on your resume or just to have in life as a friend, an advocate, employee. Um, so please be in contact with me about those. Uh, they actually changed the format so they're much easier to get now. It's 20 hours asynchronous and then 20 hours in person instead of 40 in person. So works a little bit better with everyone's schedules now. And then finally, if you have any students who are in need, you know, we're always working with students in and out of the Women's Center. Um, 
We have information out about the domestic violence hotline, and we have um, some amazing graduate students in social work. Sarah and Lex are here today with Skylar, our, our uh, mascot pup in the back. Um, but they've been working with students consistently throughout the year to help um, talk through big decisions, safety plan, you know, work on what, whatever sort of things happen to come through their door that they need a little support on. So send anyone our way, um, and we're, we're thrilled to, to help support and build this project. Any closing thoughts from, from our esteemed panelists? Um, just as far as the 40-hour domestic violence training, it was one of the best trainings that I've ever been to. Um, it was really good, really impactful, and I learned a, a lot. So if you can take advantage of the opportunity to go, I would recommend it highly. And I think with the, you know, when we take these trainings, we always think of them as like it's a what you would think of as a traditionally abusive relationship. But there's such a continuum of what can happen, you know, versus control, power, all of these things that go into it. You know, what we see by in a relationship that might raise some red flags among friends, you know, that can eventually escalate. So it's just great tools to have for anyone, you know, it doesn't even, if you're not doing direct intervention work, we all know people who are in questionable circumstances and, and a lot of the listening and safety planning and kind of psychoeducation you learn with it is really, really valuable. Um, now to turn it to the audience, uh, do you all have any questions for our panelists or any comments or things you wanna share in the spirit of Women's History Month? Uh, hello, my name is Kadir, and when you guys were talking about like what men can do to prevent women like violence and domestic abuse, I was just thinking the whole time I was like, these like um, programs and forty-hour things are good for the men too, so they can learn to see in their own behavior what could be considered abuse. Because I feel like guys are socialized in kind of a way that sometimes they do things not knowing that it is that it, it is abuse and just learning these things would be helpful for everyone overall. And that the women's center should get more money. <laughs> we love Kadir. <laughs> Thank Kadir you, Kadir. also <laughs> just signed up to be one of our peer educators, so he's starting the training process um, and is you know, the unofficial parent to, to Skylar, our, our puppy in the back, <laughs> best friend. A number of things coming up this month. Um, March 13th, we have Bisexual Health Awareness Month in the Bunnell Lobby, 11 to 2. A luncheon at NERC from 11 to 1. Um, we're going to have um, an author from CCP who is also receiving one of the Parks Leadership Scholarships. She wrote a book about how to better support single parents, so she'll be doing um, an author talk there. The um, March 14th, we're co-sponsoring an event with CME that Carl brought to our attention, um, Poetry Slam, uh, Black Women's Experience from two to four in S23. Um, we're partnering with the Mark David LGBTQ Center to do a performance on March 18th from 4.30 to 6.30, How to Be a Gender Cannibal. And then um, on March 20th, we're doing a really exciting kind of big event with Catsy and their auto tech program. We're bringing in the Girls Auto Clinic, um, Patrice, who is the founder of it, to do a panel discussion with women in that tech program, as well as if anyone feels as helpless with their car as I do, a hands-on um, kind of technical training about like fix your car 101. Um, we'll be there getting dirty, doing all the things that I don't know how to do. Um, so that's the 20th from one to three at Catsy. On March 21st is Single Parent Day nationally, so we'll be doing a giveaway in S309. Um, we have self-care bags for parents on campus, and then also our parent resource exchange, which we encourage staff and students to kind of give and take gently used items, having giveaways and items out from that. Um, March 26th, we'll have a self-defense group happening um, with women in transition from 12 to 2 in the Athletic Center. March 27th is Trans Day of Visibility in the Bunnell Lobby at 11 o'clock. There's a um, Women's History Month lunch on March 28th that's going to launch a new fund we're having, an emergency fund for women on campus. And then on March 28th, we'll be working with the Office of Collegiate Recovery to do a film screening called The Art of Survival. Um, ongoing, we have Angie's Period Product Drive. We have a survivor group for people who've experienced violence or sexual assault with um, WAR, the Sexual Violence Response Agency in the city. 
and then um, a create and connect group for women to just meet each other, kind of create some connections, build some friendships on Thursdays at 12 o'clock in Winnet. So check out the Women's History Month page, and thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>